This is Trep Wire with a special podcast, The Economic Impact of COVID-19 on Commercial Real Estate. I'm Martha Kocher with Trep, a data modeling and analytics firm for the CMBS Commercial Real Estate and CLO Markets. I'm with Manus Clancy, Senior Managing Director, and Joe McBride, Head of Siri Finance. And joining us today is Ryan Severino, Chief Economist and Frequent Speaker at JLL, a global commercial real estate services firm. Ryan, welcome. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Well, we know you well, but maybe some folks that listen to us don't know you well. So give us a quick overview of your background and your role at JLL. Uh, despite my, my boyish appearance and charm, I've actually been in the commercial real estate industry for about 23 years at this point. And I have done a slew of different things during that time. I started out in on the CMBS side, actually, on the buy side, and then I did portfolio and asset management for commercial real estate investment firm, which I didn't know were different things until I got there. Uh, I had done acquisitions work for a while, and then uh, I went to graduate school, and then I finally stopped swimming upstream. I crossed over to the dark side, and I started focusing on research. I'm a pretty nerdy academic person, I admit, and so it, it clearly fits in with uh, with what I like to do. And then over time, I just started to specialize more and more from, from broad research into being more of a pure economist, which is really what I do now. And the way that I, I think about my role is my job is to really analyze and forecast what's going on in the economy and then very discreetly figure out what the implications are for commercial real estate across property types, across geographies, and then be able to explain it to people in, in language they can understand, not language that an economist or, uh, or a mathematician would use. Well, uh, as a nerd, as you've self-described, you are welcome here in case you haven't figured that out. <laughs> so we're glad you're here. You wrote a blog and you write and speak on a lot of topics. Uh, but one thing I thought you said was interesting that the good news and the bad news is that the economy is performing in line with forecasts. What do you mean by that? Uh, so the good news was without, without straining my arm to pat myself on the back, I was actually pretty proud given the massive uncertainty that we, we are dealing with and how challenging forecasting is right now that that the results for the second quarter more or less came in in line uh, with, with about what I was expecting. I think my, my real GDP forecast for the second quarter was off only by about a percent or so. But at the same time, real GDP in the second quarter was down about 33% on an annualized basis, which is the single worst quarter in U.S. economic history since we've been keeping quarterly GDP records, which goes back to 1947. So I was happy that my modeling is, is generally pretty decent, but I was also not tremendously thrilled about the fact that we are we are clearly living through what is the worst downturn in, in I would say, most of our lifetimes by far. So we are seeing, in addition to unpre unprecedented fall off in economic numbers, we're also seeing unprecedented levels of government stimulus. Can you give us a sense of what you think is working, what is not working? Uh, perhaps if you were in the driver's seat, what would you have tweaked? And is it too little, too much, or you know, just the right amount? I think when you look at, at, at what we've been doing, I, I think government policy overall, clearly something of, of equivalent magnitude was, was in order given the challenges that, that we faced. And I consider myself a, a pretty hands-off, laissez-faire economist. I generally like to let the markets figure themselves out, and, and, and unless there's some kind of abject market failure, that there's something that's that's just not working right. And, and that's where I appreciated the government stepping in. On the monetary policy side, the Fed clearly learned some things during, we, I don't know if I should still call it the Great Recession relative to the one that we're going through now, but what used to be called the Great Recession of, of the financial crisis 11, 12 years ago, about not just cutting rates to zero, but, but intervening in markets in, in a way that was necessary to keep the financial plumbing operating smoothly. Because I think the thing that they learned, and, and to his credit, Ben Bernanke was, was a student of the Great Depression, so I think he learned this better than just about anybody, that if you wanted to keep a downturn from, from becoming longer and, and potentially even more, more painful, you really need to shore up the financial system. So to their credit, they learned a lot from that. And I think, I think the Fed should get full marks for keeping the financial system now operating as smoothly as it probably can, given some of the, the early signs in March that we might get some seizures in, in the financial system. On, on the fiscal policy side, I think the government also learned something from the last downturn, which was, I think, objectively, 
the spending packages put in place during the last downturn were not sufficiently large relative to to the magnitude of what we were dealing with. I think they clearly learned learned something this time, and they moved very quickly in a very large way to to actually put some support underneath the economy. And, and admittedly, they did it in a in a very quick fashion, so they probably didn't get everything right. There are clearly some mistakes that were made, but I, but at least from my point of view. I thought expediency was really the important thing because the longer they waited, the more painful this was going to get. And, and again, coming back to the idea that I, I'm, I'm a pretty market-oriented, laissez-faire economist, the reason that I, I'm, I'm not explicitly shaking the pom-poms for government intervention, but I think is necessary right now, is that as long as people are are sitting on the sidelines to an extent, certain businesses are closed, so they can't they can't frequent those businesses, or they don't feel safe engaging in certain activities, be that getting on an airplane, going to a bar and having a beer, going to a restaurant, going to a, a nightclub, something like that. That is going to limit the amount of money that they actually spend, which means that business revenues are going to be down, which means the amount of money that businesses have to pay to, to labor and to providers of capital and things like that are going to be down. And that is just going to keep spiraling down until we get past the pandemic. Because as long as certain businesses are closed and people don't feel safe engaging in certain things, then you're never going to get back to 100% of the economy the way that we had it before. So I almost, I take this stance that I, I see government support as being necessary right now in a way that, that I probably other wouldn't wise, uh, otherwise wouldn't champion because I just, I don't think that the market is going to fully, private marketplace is going to fully self-correct as long as businesses are forced closed by edict from the government. And there are a lot of consumers that are just afraid to go out and engage in, in certain normal economic activities right now. Yeah, it, I, it's funny to, the, we are also probably considered laissez-faire, uh, kind of from an economic standpoint on our side. And we've been having this debate, you know, over many weeks about, especially with kind of new bills in front of Congress, like the HOPE Act, um, which could potentially bail out some borrowers in the commercial real estate space. You know, if you had asked me six months ago, you know, are you for, you know, government stimulus and government fiscal policy and government packages and all these other things, I would have said, well, hopefully not, right? But now, uh, when if someone bats me over the head and tells me you can't operate your business anymore, and then they say, but we'll, we'll help you out in the meantime, I think that's reasonable, right? Uh, the, my only fear, I guess, is that just the, the sheer size of this thing. And I, I hope we never have a global pandemic like this again in our lifetime. I mean, the last one, I guess, was in like 100 years ago, 1918. Um, but I wonder like where the switch is 10 years from now, if we hit some other sort of recession for some other reason, do we throw this bazooka at the market again, just because that's what the market expects? You know, like, it's almost that like, uh, when I was in school and they talked about moral hazard and all yeah. that other stuff, right? Like, I know it's kind of so out there to, to even think about, but at what point do we let the financial markets kind of correct themselves or maybe we never do that again? Yeah, you bring up a good point about engendering moral hazard because I think that's one of the, admittedly, I think that's one of the dangers, certainly in what the Fed is doing because if you look at how the markets have responded, not just uh, the equity markets, which I saw hit uh, at least intraday above uh, the S&P, the, the previous peak before we got into this mess, but clearly there is some understanding on the part of market participants that the Fed, you know, like the proverbial put, the Fed is going to backstop the market to a certain extent. So it does, you do potentially risk engendering moral hazard. I, I think my concern is more longer term down the road i think the short term like i said it's almost impossible with with businesses closed and consumers staying away to expect the market uh, the market part of the economy to, to self correct on its own but where, where i get worried about this is when you put when you put these kind of programs in place it's very hard to pull them back at least to the fullest extent and to just show you what i mean by that if you look at both you know monetary and banking policy and and then even on the on the fiscal policy side we never fully got back to where we were before the last downturn. And if you look at some metric like like gross debt to GDP, which is, I, I think, something that, that people have at least been asking about, it's generally trending in the wrong direction. We're, we're nowhere near, uh, I, I think, 
volcanic levels, we still have a, a fairly long runway, I think, especially as the world's, at least for now, the world's global reserve currency, that we could keep borrowing, borrowing money without, without risking it, it causing a crisis. But we can't play this game ad infinitum. At some point, the world is going to change enough that we are going to find ourselves in a position where we can't really get away with that. And to me, this is, this is just, a, it's a lack of, of political will to a certain extent, because I think a lot of people know that this is, it, it's an issue. No one really wants to address it. And because it's been, been rising for such a long period of time, this is where I throw everybody under, as a very apolitical person, I have no problem throwing everybody under the bus for this. Democrats, Republicans, independents, farm animals, everybody's been complicit in this over the last 60 years or so. And my, my fear about this is that, that politicians will not take serious action until a crisis forces their hand. And I, I don't know when that could be, 15 to 20 years down the road. But again, to the idea of moral hazard, that we could just keep doing this every time a crisis turns around because the expectation is there. And we could, you know, more quickly accelerate ourselves toward toward that that inflection point somewhere down the line. Well, speaking of apolitical, the markets are up huge today. What what day is it? Is it Wednesday? Um, on Wednesday, Joe Biden announced his pick last night for Kamala Harris uh, as his VP. Do you think that that is what's driving the market today? And if so. Is it because they think he has a better chance or a worse chance of winning now? Let's hear your political prognostications. I don't know. I thought it was that accelerated Russian vaccine that everybody was getting all excited about. That, so. that Putin's daughter took? That's what I saw on Zero Hedge, I think. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, like, why would you not, why would you not believe that, that story? So, um, <laughs> you know, I think there's a, there's a conventional wisdom out there that says something like, and again, as, as an apolitical person, I'll say the conventional wisdom says something like, Republicans are good for the economy and markets and Democrats are, are bad for the economy and markets. And I think if you look at the empirical data, it's a lot more nuanced than that. And sometimes it's actually, it, it actually runs counter to the conventional wisdom. If you look at the performance of the equity markets over the last 40 years or so, uh, at least on a, if you, it, because terms are not equivalent, if you look at it on a kind of um, per annum growth rate or compound growth rate, it's done better during Democratic, Democratic administrations than Republican administrations. If you look at GDP growth per annum, if you go back to the 50s and 60s through a lot of different administrations, it's a, it's a little more of a mixed picture, but you probably get better results from Democrat administrations than people would think. And if, if, if listeners are sitting at home thinking, well, yeah, that's because of all of these other things that, would, that, that you should have in your mind, that what goes on in the economy is almost always more dependent upon what's going on on the private side of the economy, what consumers are doing, what businesses are doing, how we're innovating, how we're changing things, than just simple government policies. And I'm, I'm not discounting the role that the government can play. I'm simply saying, if you look back empirically at the last 50 or 60 years uh, of economics, certainly in the United States, I would argue that you, you will often get um, conclusions that run counter to conventional wisdom. And that's often because there's so many other things that go on in the economy that I think are so much more important than just what, what, uh, what politicians in Washington are or are not doing. I love that answer. The answer is that there's way too much to take into account. It's, right? It depends. <laughs> the, right, it, it depends. depends. <laughs> Actually, when I teach my class, I teach a sophomore finance class. Nice. That's, that's like the joke like the running joke of the semester, when I ask a question, they don't know the answer, they say it depends, because that's <laughs> normally what the answer actually is. But, you know, there's a lot of wisdom in that, because I, I, find, I find one of the issues, especially in, you know, 2020 or so, with our, our even shorter attention spans than I think, you know, we had three, four, five years ago, there's this desire or this reflex action to want to just fall back on the simple, like, heuristics and rules of thumb and, and, and just, you know, back of the envelope ways of understanding things, where in the real world, things are really complicated. Understanding something like how the entire economy works, even for, for you know, people like myself, who I, I live, sleep, eat, breathe economics some of the time, I, I would still argue there are lots of things that I, along with everybody else who does this for a living, don't understand about it. So when everybody wants to distill, you know, a, a, the largest, most sophisticated, most complex economy in the world, down to these or three rules of thumb, I, I, you know, my, my, my brain wants to explode. But taking it back to uh, the commercial real estate side, going from the macro to the micro, uh, one of the areas that's been really hard hit has been the hotel area that has really gotten almost no relief at this point. The relief that has come 
has come by way of forbearances, which is often tapping reserves to keep a loan current. And there's um, hope that the HOPE Act will do something, it'll get passed and give borrowers uh, cash in return for preferred equity and so forth. Can you talk about what this status of purgatory is doing to some of the financial markets right now, the lack of price discovery, and is it clogging the markets at this point as borrowers just wait for that Hail Mary to, to come in? I, I think that's a challenge, and it almost goes back to what we were talking about, uh, about government intervention and policy, because to an extent, it, it does kind of distort the market a little bit. It does, it does sort of prevent complete price transparency and, and, and a recognition of what is going on. And, and I think it also dovetails with, with, with something I was discussing before in the sense that, just, just to use the example of the hotel industry, I don't think as we move through this in the medium to long term, that this is the death knell for the hotel industry. The idea that we're never going on vacation again, or that there will never be business trips again. I think people sometimes don't appreciate what, what short term memories we all have about things like this. Eventually we'll pass this and we will get on airplanes again and we'll go to Disney World and Tahiti and wherever else we want to go. And my concern is, in the interim, if, if we let businesses like that, that are in this almost, you know, purgatory, the, the, this kind of hiatus state fail, then there could be some interesting ramifications for when we get past this. And then those businesses crop up because usually the argument that I hear, and, I, and I'm not discounting this argument, I think there's, it's a good argument to be made. One of, the, one of the arguments I hear about this kind of intervention that is distortive in the market is that it, it prevents the normal creative destructive process, right? In a typical downturn, you know, it's, it's like what they say about when the, you know, when the tide goes out. It, it, same thing in the business world. It reveals what businesses and business models are just not competitive that have been riding the coattails of a, of a good long expansion. If, if we lose that, I, I don't doubt that it will make the economy less productive for a while. But my concern on the other side of the ledger is we could potentially have businesses fail for, for, for no legitimate reason that might, might otherwise be viable businesses. Restaurants that have existed and bars, and I'm making myself sound like an alcoholic, but bars and restaurants <laughs> that have existed for hundreds of years, uh, you know, um, hotels that have been around for, for a really long time, even at industries that have been around. There will always be, a, 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 I think, a, a, a desire for those on the part of consumers. So while, while I appreciate that it's having a distortive effect and we have to be a little bit careful about that, especially as investors, I also think we want to be careful about not just leaving everyone to their own devices and say good luck because I think there are a lot of really good viable businesses that might not come back if we don't provide support to them. And I think, I think there are also economic consequences for that. So again, it sort of, de it sort of depends, but, but there are both sides of the coin there. I think there's a risk to potentially keeping businesses afloat that maybe shouldn't be. And I think there's a risk if we let too many businesses fail that that maybe shouldn't. And, it, and this is why I get annoyed about those kind of simple rules of thumb because it's a lot more complicated than that. I'll, I'll give you a curveball right now. Um, we didn't talk about this in, in the past, but you just brought up the, the point of creative disruption. And for the last 40 years, every time a crisis has come up, there's been either creative disruption or disruptive disruption, right? In, in the early 80s, we saw the mortgage-backed securities market emerged out of the uh, interest rate crisis. In, you know, after RTC, we saw the CMBS market. After the great financial crisis, we saw Dodd-Frank. So with everything that comes uh, through, something changes. There are winners and losers, and sometimes new markets emerge, and sometimes new regulations come out of it. Any early predictions as to, I mean, it's very early, of course, we're only a few months into this. Uh, any early predictions as to who the winners and losers might be out of this or what kind of new government mandates might emerge um, from this process? Because they always seem to. You know, my general thought on that is whoever will be able to adapt to whatever the health-oriented landscape is on the other side of this the best will come out with a competitive advantage. And just to give you an, an analogy for this, think back to what the world was like before and after 9-11, right? Same kind of grand proclamation. Nobody's going to travel again. Nobody's going to feel comfortable getting on an airplane. Remember all the things they were saying about New York. Nobody's going to want to live there. Nobody's going to want to work there. And then look where the world went over the last 19 years between what happened then and where we were before this. And 
what, what in my mind, what really happened to enable that is that not only did we all adapt as, as consumers and citizens, but, but businesses and municipalities adapted to that, right? So airport security was different than what it was before. Airline procedures were different. The ability to just waltz in, you know, I, I used to think before 9-11, I could walk out of the building I, I, I worked in with big bags that said loot on the side like a cartoon character, nobody would stop me. Now I have to like give a DNA sample and sign over my firstborn before they'll even let me into a building in, in New York City. We just adapted to that and I think the parts of the economy that, that adapt to that, because I think clearly on the other side of this, some kind of health reckoning is going to change, whether that's temperature scans in airports, whether that is um, uh, before you're allowed to, to stay in a hotel or attend a conference or something. I, I, you know, and in a way, I almost kind of welcome that, given how often I, I used to sit down on an airplane and the person sitting next to me would sit down visibly ill and clearly shouldn't have been there. But... Um, the businesses that adapt to that, because I do think there's probably going to be some kind of encroachment in terms of either government mandated regulation or, or just industries themselves taking it upon themselves to, to kind of calm the fears of consumers for a while. I think the ones that adapt to that the best, what be those industries or businesses, are the ones that will be the winners on the other side of this. It's funny you mentioned uh, the 9-11 analogy. I said that exact same thing to Keegan this morning when we were talking about it. And um, on the flight thing, I was on a flight back from Chicago. I think it, it would, maybe it was February or maybe it was late January. It was like before this thing really blew up, but it was start, people were starting to talk about it. And I had had the flu like two weeks earlier and I was still coughing up a lung and I felt terrible for the woman sitting next to me who had her shirt over her face the entire flight. <laughs> I wanted to turn to her and tell her like, I just had the flu. I, I swear I'm fine. It's fine. I'm not sick anymore. <laughs> uh, but they might not let me on the flight, you know, in the future. I, I, in my very simplistic brain, I'm thinking this is a three-year deal. So to me, a year from now, next summer, we're at a point where most people have access to a vaccine. Uh, the high-risk people probably have taken it. Uh, maybe, you know, more and more people are starting to take it. A year after that, we're to the point where people realize, okay, this vaccine works and you know, there's no, we're not growing like a seventh toe or anything like that. Uh, and then a year after that, we've kind of completely forgotten it. At least, you know, I think of 9-11, because in New York, we talked about that for years. But at some point you got to the point, maybe it was four, three, four, five years after where, you know, it just wasn't in the top of your mind anymore. And I, I kind of have that same idea for this, except this is global. Right. This is not just right. kind of New York centric. Yeah. I mean, the one thing I would say is that, you know, after six months uh, of behavior like this, um, the bean counters at every firm get kind of addicted to not spending on business travel. Think about cutting your, your square footage in half because you could save half your rent, things like that. Um, what do you think about that, Ryan? You know, kind of the demographic and systemic changes that could come out of this. You know, you said before that we will come back to travel and of course people will go to Disney, they will go to the movies, they will go to concerts and so forth. But does this change the landscape of um, the office space, uh, business travel, people, you know, kind of getting addicted to saving money that they used to kind of just write checks for every month, you know, six and seven figure checks just to uh, keep the business running. I I think what you're likely to get out of this, it, 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 you know, going back to the theme of it depends, some of it will, will depend on, on business specifics, but my guess is, and we've already seen this with our clients a little bit, you're going to get a diversity of responses to this. We've seen some clients who, who you know, are, are, are seriously, you know, thinking about their footprint right now. We've seen other clients that are looking to expand to capitalize on the downturn. My, my thought on this is for something like like business travel, maybe it raises the bar to, to actually warrant going on a trip, you know, relative to what things were like before. And, and, and in my mind, it's almost akin to, to where you are in a business cycle. When you're in a down cycle, the bar is set higher for you to actually get on an airplane and go somewhere. It has to be incredibly important. When revenues are up and, and, and business is, is flowing, it becomes a competitive advantage in some respects to go see a client or speak at an event in a way that, that you might not before. So I still think you'll see some 
cyclicality to it, even if in aggregate on a structural basis, it sets the bar a little bit higher. I think in terms of things like working in an office, again, it's gonna come down to a lot of different specifics that my guess is will probably net each other out. And then as long as the economy continues to grow, we'll generally grow the demand base over time because I think for, for every client that I've talked to who's considering maybe shrinking their footprint, there are others who are thinking about increasing it either to capitalize on the downturn or because they're going to have to go through de-densification and they want to increase the square footage per person. Because I think there's, not to sound like an, an, an urban economist, but there are a lot of advantages to everybody, not just working together in an office, but being co-located in the same place together. If you look at, um, if you look at how, how economies are performing over time, they're becoming not explicitly more urban, but they're becoming more metropolitan. And the reason they're becoming more metropolitan is because productivity growth is higher in those areas than it is in outlying areas. And that's because there are undoubtedly benefits to all of us being together. And, and, and it's, it's not even so much the people that you're used to working with and talking to. It's the random you know, person you bump into in the hallway that you have a conversation or you go out here we go again with the alcohol, but you go out to happy hour with your coworker after work and he introduces you to his friend or her friend um, and, and, and he or she works in, in a different business and you start talking about what you do and what they do and then she says, oh, well, in our business, we do it this way and then the light bulb goes off in your head and you say, wow, you know, I never thought about that. I wonder if I could apply that to what I do and then you make the connection and you're off and running with a new idea. And so if all of us are just sitting in our houses and we're not having those conversations, it definitely takes something away from the economic dynamism and it, it really runs counter to the way that the economy has been evolving over time. So my guess is there'll be some organizations that just say, you know what, we don't need as much physical space, we're going to downside. There'll be some that say, we, we like being in a physical space, but we want a diversity of locations. We don't just want to be concentrated in city centers. There will be some that increase their space to capitalize on, on a downturn in the market. There'll be some that in, increase their space because they want to go through de-densification. Um, and, and my guess is all of those things probably more or less net each other out. And then as long as the economy continues to grow, I'd expect to see more demand for, for being in an office over time. But I do think people do have relatively short attention spans. We get on the other side of this and not everybody's ending up in the hospital. People will realize that even if they wanted to stay home, they're being left out of those conversations. And they're wondering if they're not being included in, in impromptu meetings and being passed over for promotions and things like that, which is what people worried about, uh, about working from home before all of this started. I could see the return of, you know, remember when we first started working, maybe, maybe you know, you don't remember this, but we used to have the mail slots. And, you know, sometimes in old movies, you see the vacuum tubes. <laughs> right, where a guy would stick, stick something in the vacuum tube, it would disappear and go up to the eighth floor. I could see people coming in and saying, God, please don't make me get on that elevator again today. The last time I got on the elevator, I didn't come back for 45 minutes. I had to wait online, right? I, I could see a resurgence of some of these old technologies that uh, <laughs> retired a couple decades ago. They Trump, actually, yeah. they actually did. Re like that. They replaced that with email, Manis. I don't know if you... Uh, <laughs> it just makes me think of Tommy Boy when Rob Lowe gets his shirt sucked up by the air tube thing, and he keeps sitting there as if nothing happened. <laughs> so Ryan, it sounds like you're, uh, in general, you are a uh, long-term optimist and long-term long on the general trends that we had been seeing pre-COVID. So urban, more people moving to urban areas, you know, the whole millennial story even though during the last six months or five months, whatever it's been, it seems like all of the trends that we were seeing as positives kind of reverse themselves, right? Young people moving out of the cities, moving to different places. Like, or do you think that that's, that's just transitory? The way I think about this is almost the way that I think doctors have described it for people. If there was a pre-existing condition before this, then COVID is going to make it worse. If you didn't have a pre-existing condition, you could probably get through this okay. I think very quietly there were some trends that were going on that people were not cognizant of. Like, there's this perception out there that, that and, and I'm not picking on, on anyone or anything specifically, but that millennials are going to live in urban areas, taking their bicycles and or public transportation to their green open plan offices where they're going to hold hands and sing Kumbaya and be really productive. And that wasn't really true because what happened was coming out of the last recession, it, you got faster growth in urban areas than 
suburban areas because mobility always declines during during downturns, and that was at least until this this crisis was such a daunting downturn that it severely impaired mobility. So you still had people moving into cities, but you didn't really have people moving out because economically, for a lot of people, it wasn't feasible to do so. And as the economy started to convalesce, you started to see a reversion back to those typical patterns. And I'm going to get the exact years wrong, but over the last five, six, seven years of, of the last decade, suburban areas grew faster than urban areas. And it's not a story that I think has been told very well or very understood. And some of that was because millennials started to do what, what we all do. They, they started to get older and they got, especially, you know, working professionals in urban areas. They got older, they got married, they had children. And then they, they realized that you can't really raise two kids in, in Manhattan in 1,100 square feet unless you're you know, a doctor or white shoe firm lawyer or a hedge fund trader or something. So you can afford something bigger than that. So they started moving out to the suburbs in New Jersey and New York and Connecticut and Long Island and places like that. And it wasn't just true in New York. It was true in Boston and D.C. and Chicago and places like that. And this will probably just, again, going back to my, my kind of COVID analogy, it will probably exacerbate that trend. You'll probably see people who are on the fence thinking, how long can we stay in an urban area with our, our you know, 2.1 kids before we have to move to the suburbs kind of thing, it will probably push that along. The same way I think before the downturn, you were seeing this massive rift between uh, class A and class BC office buildings, especially in urban areas. This is probably going to exacerbate that because they are better positioned to have things like touchless technology and better uh, you know, HVAC filtration systems and things like that bigger elevators and, and uh, you know, the ability to, to, to maybe social distance a little better than older buildings with interior columns and, um, you know, smaller, smaller floor plans and smaller elevator wells and things like that. So my thought on this is, is the trends I think that we were generally seeing before, um, before this crisis, it probably just exacerbates those. Eventually there'll be new trends to come along, but, but my guess is it, it, it functions very much like, like we talk about people. It, it depends if you had a, uh, a pre-existing condition or not. I hope Keegan was listening to that part. I've been trying to get him to move out of freaking Brooklyn for like five years. Come on, man, come up to the suburbs, join us. You know, us millennials who've had an, actually I never moved into the city. I went to high school in the city. I don't need to, I don't need to live 40. there. You were born I'm, 40, Joe. I was born 40, right, <laughs> right. Never been a millennial, sorry. So Ryan, obviously, as an economist, you talk to a lot of clients because they're looking for forecasts for their business. What has changed since the shutdown and the recession? What What is uh, the work that you're doing and how are you in demand? You know, I can honestly say it. I, 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 I didn't have copious free time before this, but I'm not sure I've ever been, been busier. I think one of the... Uh, one of the positives I, I realized about my owner's travel schedule before this is that I, I'm kind of on my own when I'm on an airplane or staying in a hotel. It, it, I, I lost a lot of that alone time I'm now appreciating because now that people know I'm not going anywhere, they see an open slot on my calendar and they say, oh, you can do a presentation here. You don't have anything going on. Um, I, I think it's, it's sort of the, um, uh, the classic story that, that when the economy is doing well and everybody thinks that they, that, that they know what's going on and things are going to persist, they'll still ask me about what's going on, have me present things like that. But, but in the back of their minds, they're like, yeah, I got this economics thing. I took economics once 78 years ago. I know how the economy works. So they're not as, 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 uh, as engaging with, I think, the value that I bring to the table. Once it starts to hit the fan a little bit and, and really go off the rails, all of a sudden people are like, oh, I better ask somebody who um, has a better handle on this than I do. So I think people have been more interested in just the general trajectory of where the economy is going as uncertainty has really widened out over, I think, the last four or five months or so. I think people are, are more interested in generally knowing where I think the economy is, is headed relative to what, it, what I think demand was for that information was like. 6, 12 months ago. And then I think as the, the corollary to that, also what I think is going to happen in the markets, because same sort of rule of, uh, rule of thumb, if people think that rents are going to keep going up, then they're not, not worried about the, you know, the rent forecast down to the basis point. But as soon as they're, they're realizing that rents are starting to deteriorate and they, they'll probably uh, backslide for a while, now all of a sudden, now not just people who are looking to, to close deals, but, but you know, landlords who have existing assets, all of a sudden, and, and I don't think I'm going out on a limb in saying this, 
Um, underwriting's changed dramatically when you're doing sort of pro forma forecasting now for, for relative to what people were thinking, you know, six, nine, 12 months ago. And so there's been more acute interest in, in rent growth forecasts, vacancy forecasts, things like that. Um, and I, my guess is until we get through the, the, the worst of this, that will probably continue, that you'll see more increased interest in that relative to what, what things were like before. Because again, I think when things are going well, either people don't fixate on it or they think they know what's going to happen next. As soon as you really run into this monster pool of uncertainty, I think people realize uh, I should probably talk to somebody who, who thinks about this uh, more than I do. We're seeing the same thing on our end. We're not, you know, we're not economists for sure, but we have a lot of really valuable information and data. And, you know, we're getting so much inbound from all different sides of the world, right? Regulators, economists, and then regular old commercial real estate investors. Um, I think that same thing happened during the last crisis, right? The moment things start changing, people are looking to, to, for a toehold, right? To see what's actually going on. So let me ask you uh, a question. I assume you have some sort of, you know, magical Severino economist dashboard that tracks all sorts of macroeconomic and microeconomic data. But are there, uh, being a data guy myself, are there data points that we would be surprised to know that you're looking at or kind of weird alternative data stuff that you look at? You know what's interesting about that question? I, prior to this, I would tell you that I probably didn't pay a lot of attention to some of those alternative data points. I think now just given uh, you know the the rapidity with which the crisis unfolded. I'll, I'll I'll tell you that I haven't explicitly started including them in in the way that my my econometric models work, but I definitely have been taking a look at them because I think I, I think that I'm I'm I'm, I'm going to sound like an economist, but I'm of two minds on this. On the one hand, even though it takes longer to get the official data, it's really vetted, right? When the jobs numbers come out, when the GDP print comes out, those kinds of data points, they have been really vetted by economists and statisticians and mathematicians who just, they, they really pour their lives into that. So when I see a, a, a GDP number or a job number, I know that it's it's been put through the quality control ringer before they put that out there, which is why I'm always, massively dismissive of conspiracy theorists who say, oh, they're just putting that out there to make the president look better or something like that. I'm like, really? Do you have any idea what goes into producing that? But at the same time, it takes a while to go through that vetting quality control process. I mean, the second quarter ended uh, at the end of, of you know, June, and, and we're sitting here in August, um, and I only recently got the print on first quarter GDP because it takes time to you know, within the last you know, week or two, because it takes time to actually get that information and, and, and put it together. But there's also, I think, a role to play for some of these non-traditional metrics because they do come out so quickly. So I've been looking at things like, um, like restaurant bookings to see how they've been trending up and down on a, on a, you know, a real-time basis. Mobility indexes, which I think are pretty good at showing you how much people are moving around. Uh, or not moving around, especially via different forms of transportation. I haven't included them in any of my modeling, either my, my um, you know, sort of macro econometric modeling or, or my real estate econometric modeling, but I do think that it helps create a bigger picture, even if maybe it hasn't gone through the full, um, you know, sort of quality control vetting process that, that some of the officials do. So in my mind, I think it creates more of a complete picture, even if I'm not willing to say, oh, I'm, I'm willing to, to build a forecast based on this particular metric because i'm not not wholly sure that it, it it you know it holds up to that scrutiny just yet but i will tell you i've looked at a, more of that data over the last five months than i i looked at over the last five years and i think a lot like a lot of that mobility stuff before the data was incredibly noisy from everything that i've seen right in terms of like cell phone and maybe even like bookings things like that but now it's it's binary almost it's like are people going to restaurants or not, right. right? Or are people going to this building or not? Not like has, the, has it increased or decreased by five or 10%. It's like, has it increased at all from zero to something or not, right? And it tells you some interesting things too, right? Like if you look at the mobility indexes, one of the interesting things that I, I and I'm sure if you've been paying attention, you saw this, is that things like driving and walking are pretty much back up to where they, back up to about where they were before the downturn. But public transportation is still pretty much near the, the trough of, of where it hit. 
And that's because not only are people not going into the office as frequently as they once did, they, they clearly don't feel safe doing that. And so in my mind, even if that data isn't exactly correct down to the basis point, it's still telling me something interesting, objectively interesting and useful, thinking about how the economy is evolving and trying to, to convalesce and, and get back to where it was before we got into this mess. One of, one of the big areas we watch all the time right now in particular is student housing. And, uh, you know, we think that that will be very troubled. It was kind of troubled going into this. It had some soft spots of overbuilding and it had seen some delinquencies before, before COVID and now there's a lot more uncertainty. But the big alternative data point for me this past week was driving from New York to South Carolina, which I do pretty frequently. And you normally see 50 to 100 cars, Hondas stuffed to the gills with um, all kinds of boxes and uh, computers and so forth. And you know, it's students going back to school. And I noticed on this particular trip, you know, 12 hours on the road, I saw one that fit this category. And to me, that was a negative tell for the types of numbers that these uh, Southern colleges are going to see, um, you know, when their numbers get booked in September, October, November, it, it seemed um, just a, an enormous fall off. And that's clearly anecdotal evidence, but in the past, they would be everywhere. No, and you bring up a good point because I think it, going back to my idea of like if you had a pre-existing condition or not, there were already some some uh, you know cracks in the facade around things like student housing, especially given I, I'm not gonna I'm, I'm not going to call it an education bubble because I'm I'm the world's biggest proponent of education. I will never tell people to not get an education, but you were already seeing issues about things like peak enrollment, especially at universities that and colleges that maybe were not offering, a, you know, the quality of the education relative to the cost. I think especially once you started to see um, things like foreign enrollments pull back because foreign students tend to pay full freight in a lot of places. And, and so I think, it, again, going to the pre-existing condition thing, this is probably going to accelerate some of that. There are some schools that are probably getting by longer than they should have on, on an education that, that might not be up to par relative to the cost because of things like foreign students coming to the United States for an education. And, and there, there's been, a, I think, a big upswing in demand in education over the last 30, 40, 50 years as the economies evolved. But I think one of the things that, that this is going to lay bare is, you know, which of those institutions is really worth, is really worth paying for, especially if you have to do it via distance learning for a while, and which of those isn't. And I think that is going to have interesting consequences, not just for the, the higher education industry, but I think also for the student housing industry, because I, I and I think you've, you've probably seen this as well as I have, some of those student housing developments over the last 10 years were predicated on these relatively optimistic, to be somewhat euphemistic about it, relatively optimistic forecast of, of student enrollments over time. And I think that's that's a potentially dangerous thing to do when it's when it's dependent upon things like foreign students and uh, and this this demand for education, which clearly looks like it has at least, if not peaked, it's at least stalled temporarily. And you're also a professor at Columbia and NYU. You have class this fall. I do have class this fall. After I think it starts after Labor Day. So how's that going to go? Online hybrid. Online, and I did online for the latter half of the spring semester and then the summer semester. And you know, one of the good things about, about doing things like this frequently is I think relative to the average professor, I'm much more adept at Zoom than not, again, not like patting myself on the back, but I had been doing this so frequently that, that teaching class on Zoom, maybe not, maybe not ideal, but, uh, but I think you're clearly seeing, I think, a, a diversions between professors who have been used to doing something a certain way for decades and now all of a sudden are, are maybe not as enamored with this versus, I mean, I've been teaching for 11 years at this point, but I'm so used to using the technology that while I, I would have preferred to have been in a classroom, um, it wasn't that hard for me to make the transition. But I do wonder, outside of, of those pockets where you have uh, students who are, who are really motivated and want to be there, how much demand is there going to be for for class online uh, relative to being there? Because I think sort of like the discussion about being in offices and those spillovers and things, I, I can tell you that if you're a motivated student, you can get a lot out of taking a class online, but there's still something lost. Um, not just 
you know, the recognition of whether or not people are understanding, but the impromptu conversations and the body language and people asking questions that lead to other tangential questions, um, you definitely lose some of that, which I think to an extent is why um, you haven't really seen the business model for education change over time, even, uh, even as technology's changed. It's still best delivered with a professor and a physical classroom with a reasonable number of students. And as limiting as that is on productivity growth, if we could build a better mousetrap, we would have done so by now, at least for the majority of students. And so I, I, I think there's going to be a reckoning between uh, the schools that, that can pull this off well, and I think the schools that can't pull this off well. As we look back on this conversation, we've talked about no bars, no school, and no office interaction for the next 12 months. I just wonder how the human race continues. Like, how do men and women meet if there's no bars, no school, and no... Uh, office interaction <laughs> you know it's it, i i don't want to sound like i'm playing amateur anthropologist but we clearly evolved to be social creatures and you know my, one of my favorite rules of economics is that something will persist as long as the benefits outweigh the costs so as i again i'm not an anthropologist i don't play one on tv i certainly didn't stay at a holiday Inn express last night but <laughs> playing amateur anthropologist coupled with how i think about economics we are social creatures almost undoubtedly because the benefits outweigh the cost. I worry, to your point, I worry about what happens if we are not being social creatures the way that we have evolved over, you know, thousands, millions of years to get to this point. If we're not interacting with the diversity of people in the workplace, in a school setting, in social settings, especially because I think there's a safety valve now because we're, we're at the part in the calendar year where the weather's relatively warmer. When we get to the colder, colder months in the fall into the winter, where we can't just all be sitting outside so easily, it's still, at least according to doctors and scientists, a bad idea for people to be gathering together indoors. If you think people are antisocial right now, wait until the cold weather comes around and we can't all just dine outdoors or sit at a bar outdoors or sit in the backyard on the patio in Central Park or whatever the case is. That is going to be a world of difference relative to what things are like now. I'm not sure a lot of people are, are psychologically ready for that. I'm sure not. Sounds like The Shining. <laughs> <laughs> bringing me down, guys. You're bringing me down. That's me in my attic, right? <laughs> All work and no play. <laughs> and if you are a prospective student of Professor Severino this fall, the answer is it depends. <laughs> so keep that in mind uh, as we close this special podcast. Thank you again to our guest, Ryan. Thanks to our producer, Keegan St. Anjme. Join us later this week as we look at what's happened during the week and how it may be impacting you. If you have a question, send us an email at podcast at trep.com. Until then, visit trep.com for more info and subscribe to the Trepwire podcast with your favorite provider. Thank you for listening and stay well. All right. All right.